Hey there, Captain Roger from the Salvation Army Corps in Grass Valley, and uh, we are gathering here digitally for our uh, weekly um, uh, worship and study time. Grab a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 20, because I am going to be reading to you from Matthew chapter 20, and we're going to spend a little time explaining some of the stuff that's going on there, but some of the things I'm going to read is going to make you go, what? Is that really in the Bible? And you're going to want to look it up for yourself, so you might as well just find it right now. Besides, anytime someone tells you something's in the Bible, it's just a good idea to look it up for yourself and make sure it's really in there. Even if it's me, don't trust any of us. Just look it up and know for yourself, right? Okay, Matthew chapter 20. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. Hopefully you found it. Uh, Matthew is writing a biography of the life of Jesus, and we have been working our way through it since the beginning of the year. And each one of these little bite-sized pieces that uh, Matthew puts in here is just another piece, another building block in the wall that is our story of Jesus. So, Matthew chapter 20, I'm going to read verses 17 through 19 to start us off. <clears throat> now, Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and he said to them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. Now, this is the third time he's tried to get this across to these guys. And this is this is more detailed than any of the other descriptions of what's going to happen. In fact, for us, if there was any question about whether Jesus knew what was going to happen to him, this should really dispel it. I mean, he has pretty much spelled this out to the moment here is Israel's leaders are going to arrest me. They're going to condemn me. And then they're going to hand me over to the Romans for abuse and execution. And then on day three, resurrection. But the disciples, the, the 12 in particular that he's pulled aside here, they, they still don't get it. Now, I got to tell you, it's not entirely their fault. I mean, we get it, but we know the end of the story. Now, if one of your friends was talking about the things that he planned to do after he was dead, you'd probably look at them a little sideways, though, wouldn't you? That's part of what's going on here. People uh, back then, they knew that when you die, that's it. It's over. It's done. It's finished. And these guys knew that, and they also knew that Jesus uses a lot of hyperbole when he taught, and he uses some outrageous illustration, and he tells some strange and offensive stories that they just don't get. It's entirely possible they all thought he's just trying to make some point that they weren't catching and they were afraid to ask about it for fear of losing face because they know that he's talked about it a couple of times before. After all, they were certain, absolutely certain at this point that Jesus must be the Messiah. And the Messiah couldn't possibly die, at least not before conquering the world, right? So what could Jesus be fussing about anyway? I ran across one commentator who said that the loneliness of the passion narrative begins here because Jesus is really separated from his guys and he's trying to bring them in. And I'm sure that he knows they're going to get it eventually, but I bet he would rather that they were all with him instead of just being along for the ride. You know, know what I mean? And then this, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. <laughs> now, Jesus managed to get the 12 key followers, uh, you know, off separated from the big group so that he could share this really important thing with them about what was going to happen to him. And they, they didn't understand. And he, he knows they really aren't going to be able to understand. And they head back towards the main group. And the Sons of Thunder, that's what the Zebedee boys were called, they start waving for their mom to come over. And then the three of them corner Jesus for a little chat. Uh, yeah, there's some interesting stuff about uh, this family. Um, some scholars think that this woman is actually more than just mother to two of, key, uh, two of Jesus' uh, key disciples. There's some suggestion she might be the, the woman who's called Salome elsewhere. <laughs> there are other references to uh, someone by that name who seems to be her um, in other places in scripture, uh, like um, standing at the cross beside the mother of Jesus, uh, watching him struggle to breathe near the end of his life there. 
Uh, some other scholars go further. They point to some possible cues in the text that suggest that this woman, the, the wife of Zebedee, she might be Mary's sister, which would make her Jesus' aunt. There'd be this family connection which could embolden her to make a request like the one that she just did. Now, there's no real evidence of this family relationship. It's just a handful of suggestions and some intriguing possibilities, so we're not likely to be able to know the whole truth of that in this world. It's also entirely possible she's just a typical Mediterranean mother. I mean, they were known to seek status through and for their sons in uh, the traditions of their people. She could get away with some pretty bold asks because she was an older woman and their culture called for giving extra respect where such women were concerned. There's some other things going on here which might not be so obvious to you and I at the first read as well. She is approaching Jesus the way a client approaches a patron. Now a patron is a person who has resources and power and a client is someone who could benefit from that patron agreeing to take them on and help them out. The relationship that would be forged by the potential client asking the, the patron for a favor was going to be a, a, an abiding relationship. And even though a patron could seek out a potential client and offer them aid too, usually it was a client coming to the patron for the favor. And once they were granted this favor, the client would actually become part of that patron's network of dependents. And the patron could ask them to provide whatever service might be required, and the client would then treat that patron as if they were the head of their household, an, an honored parent or friend um, who they respected and would abide by their decisions. The client could ask for more help if they needed it, and they would also know that they were expected to do whatever another client of their patron might need. It was part of that family obligation. And this cross obligation was part of a sacred relationship between the patron and the client. Often, a client would start their day by dressing up and going to visit their patron just to see if there was any service they could perform before they went about their day. And sometimes, many times, actually, the uh, obligation of a client towards their patron or their patron's house, it would become hereditary. It was an obligation that was passed on from generation to generation to generation. Clients needed patrons to live well in this culture. And we, we find the fingerprints of the patronage system woven throughout scripture from early times through the end. It's easy for us to miss it because we don't live in this kind of a culture. But for the people of the first century in this part of the world, this was part of the fabric of their society. This was something that went on so uh, constantly that they didn't even think about it most of the time. It was just the way things were. In, um, in these times, clients would have this fierce loyalty to their patrons, and their patrons would be referred to as their friends. So, uh, like in John chapter 19, there's a verse where a crowd of people at a trial, they accuse Pontius Pilate of not being a friend of Caesar because of one of his decisions. Pilate, he was concerned that a report like that might harm his position as Caesar's client, and so he relents and he does what he's asked. And in the Roman version of this system, Caesar, he's like the ultimate patron or benefactor of all the Roman citizens. And then city officials and governors like Pilate, they were considered brokers, mediators between Caesar and the people. See, a broker's job was to introduce clients to patrons and to use the patrons' resources, which were theirs to control, to help the clients, the clients, in the name of the patron. They, uh, they brought the patron's benefits to the patron's clients. And then they would also help clear up or smooth over any misunderstandings or missteps which would harm the relationship between the client and the patron. Y'all with me? Patrons and clients were family. They're part of the same house. Just like blood relations. This was a lifelong commitment to care for and benefit each other. So if there was any challenge between the client and patron, having that mediator, that broker to help fix that was important. The mother of James and John is approaching Jesus in an effort to act as a broker for her sons. She's appealing to him as a patron. The, the favor she's seeking on their behalf is the, the two positions of honor that are closest to Jesus, who she assumed would be king. After all, he was the Messiah. 
There had been plenty of evidence offered for that, by the way. Anyone who was paying any attention should have figured it out by now. Jesus, he's been actively traveling and teaching for almost three years, and the signs he performed, the, the miracles, the teaching, everything pointed to him being the one that they had been waiting for. And her sons, James and John, they had been with Jesus and Peter when, when they'd gone up this sacred mountain. And they'd been witnesses to that mysterious transfiguration where he began to glow and he met with the spirits of Moses and Elijah. And they had all heard the voice of God praising his son. Jesus was the Messiah. There was no question about it. The Israelites had expected the Messiah for a long time. For the last 80-some years, since the Roman legions had marched into Israel and placed the nation under their oppressive rule, the yearning for a Messiah had grown more and more and more among the people of Israel. It had actually become a national obsession. Messiah would come and drive out the invaders. That's what they were waiting for. Messiah would come and raise a sword and a banner and lead an uprising that would overthrow the legions. Messiah would come and destroy their enemies and restore Israel to its greatness. And the world would be under their feet. And Jesus had told his apostles that they would sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes. James and John didn't just want to sit on those thrones. They wanted to sit on the thrones that were right next to Jesus. The places of highest honor beside the king himself which is why they asked their mother to intercede for them and asked Jesus to promise them this one little favor. You know, before one of the other 10 key disciples thought to ask. And Jesus, he doesn't fall for the, oh, it's just a mom asking a favor for her son's thing. He looks right at James and John, look at verse 22. He says, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Absolutely, they cried, having absolutely no idea what he was talking about. Drinking from a cup is good, right? Psalm 16, verse 5 says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. And in Psalm 23, the psalmist says to God, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Those sound good, right? Yeah, maybe, but Psalm 75 teaches that in the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices, and he pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. And then there was this thing in Lamentations about God pouring out the cup of his wrath on sin. It says, Rejoice and be glad, daughter Edom, you who live in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup will be passed, and you will be drunk and stripped naked, and your punishment will end, daughter Zion. He will not prolong your exile, but he will punish your sin, daughter Edom, and expose your wickedness. I couldn't be related to this cup Jesus is talking about, could it? In fact, this is the same cup mentioned in Isaiah 51 as the cup of God's wrath, the wrath of the Lord drained to its dregs. But Jesus wouldn't be talking about drinking a cup of suffering for sin, would he? He's the Messiah, after all. Hmm. Verse 23, Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Yeah, you'll get to drink from your cup, boys. But I can't give you the favor you're looking for. Jesus is telling them, he's not the patron. God is. Jesus is a broker. He can't offer any gift that his patron hasn't given him to give. And those places of honor, those are out of his hands. If you've followed this story all the way through Matthew's telling from the beginning, you may have seen what the Zebedees had missed. Jesus has never pointed to himself as the ultimate benefactor. He has always pointed to God as father, as patron of the family, as ruler of the kingdom. Jesus is the broker who mediates between the patron and the client. He's acting as the agent of God's kingdom, reaching out to draw people into this network, offering them many benefits and a place to belong as a friend of God. 
But what his followers keep looking for is something else, it's something more. They keep trying to take more from the patron than they've been offered, even though they have been offered all they could ever need and more, they keep grasping for something that is not what is promised. And this little power play to try to edge the other apostles off the throne nearest to Jesus is just the latest naked grab to be the most important among all of them. The other apostles, by the way, who are standing right there watching this whole exchange. But I suppose you don't get the nickname Sons of Thunder if you don't make some storms as you pass through life, huh? Look at verse 24. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers, yeah, which is polite Bible language. What it really says here is that they were pissed. The, the words of our NIV interpreters sh um, should be a little different. Uh, they, words they should have used instead of indignant are the words angry, aggrieved, and resentful because it's harsh. It's a hard knot of a feeling that's being referred to here. Why do they feel this way? Well, obviously, because every one of these so-called followers is still firmly and completely of the belief that they are the most important. So how dare these two try to edge them out from the seats of honor? And this is the argument we keep coming back to with the apostles, isn't it? Who matters most? Shouldn't that be me? Shouldn't I be the most important? Verse 25 says, you know what? Jesus called them all together and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. He, he's just describing the patronage system at work, by the way. The, the rulers are the Caesars and the kings. And their high officials are the, the brokers who dispense favors and rule over the others. The, the same thing that all of the apostles keep trying to do to one another with this argument they're having about who is most important. It's the same thing most of us try to do to everyone else if we're honest about it. We always want to be the one who is the most important. But this isn't the way of Jesus. This is not the way of Jesus. Look what he says, verse 26. Um, actually, let me reread verse 25 real quick. Jesus called them together. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. This is the way of the world, right? Okay, now verse 26. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He might as well say, hey, look, we just went over this more than once. Pay attention. The last will be first. So stop fighting over being first because you're going to end up being last. Look what he says again. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Now, servant is from the word for deacon. A deacon's job was to arrange things for the benefit of others. The title of deacon was given to like head waiters or to masters of ceremony who actually organized and ran ceremonial dinners to honor other people. That deacon, it's a selfless position. It's supposed to be focused entirely on helping others. And to say that whoever wants to be first needs to be a slave. Hmm. That was a highly offensive thing to say to a free man in those days or any day. Be a slave? You mean give up all my rights to serve someone else as my main priority? You mean help someone else get into my throne? Y yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it means. It's not your throne. So help them into it. You don't need a seat. Jesus used a rabbinic argument style here. It's got a, a technical name, but we can call it the how much more argument. He says, look, if he, the Lord and master, has come to serve, even though if anyone should expect to be served on earth, it's him. But if he has come to serve, then how much more should those who claim to follow him humble themselves? 
how much more should they give their lives to serve others instead of trying to rule? How much more should we focus on doing what Jesus tells us instead of trying to make him do what we want? I threw that last one in for free. Verse 28 is one of those whole salvation in a verse things. You should memorize it. You should remember it. It's all any of us needs to know about the purpose of life. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This tells us how we should live and why. We're not here to be served. We are here to serve, just like Jesus. Why? Because he came and he paid a price to ransom the rest of us. That price was his very life. When someone dies for you, it should mean something to you. We like to say that salvation is free. But you know what? It's not. It's not. There's a tremendous cost. But Jesus paid the cost. There's nothing left for you or I to pay for. Salvation is a gift, but like any gift, it has to be accepted to be had. Like someone offering you a $20 bill, if they offer it to you, but you just walk on by, you don't have that gift. It's like someone giving you a birthday present. It's great, but if you don't take that birthday present and open up the box and see what's in there, you don't have that gift. Like a great patron offering you a place as a client in their family. You, you need to take it to have it. So the question becomes, if this is what Jesus is offering, will you take it? Will you take it? You need to take it to have it. You know what? We're going to end right there. Pray with me. Lord God, creator and patron of the universe, we accept your offer to become your clients, your friends, and part of your family. We are grateful for the gift that you have given us through Jesus. Help us to remember that gratitude. Help us remember that we are to help and serve others just as Jesus showed us. Help us to remember that we are the clients, not the king. You will provide all we need and more if we just trust you. It can be hard for us to trust because our, our earthly examples tend to be so poor. Remind us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Let him be our broker with you. Let him be the example that we build our lives on, not any of these earthly things. Help us to focus on our relationship with you as being the most important thing. Not our status, not which throne we sit on, not how much money we have or how much power. Help us focus on our relationship with you. If we're part of your family, you care for us, and that is all that we need. That's all that we'll ever need. And it's more than any of us can hope for without you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Hey, remember, wherever you go, God is already there. So you've got nothing to fear. Just go with God. Grace and peace to each and every one of you this week. Good luck.